monetary situation. The March Federal Open Market Committee meeting is taking place today and tomorrow, and I'm just wondering if you expect any surprises from the FOMC this month. Well, there is one thing in play. Clearly, they are not going to raise interest rates. If they did, I would be shocked, but so would everybody else. As you know, John, I'm not uh, shy or averse to being out of consensus. I've made a number of out of consensus forecasts. I'm never troubled by that. If my analysis points me in a certain direction, that's where I go. But I don't do it just to be contrary. I do it because that's where the analysis takes me. But there are times when I think the consensus has got it right, and this is one of them. So I'm not expecting a rate increase by the Fed, and I don't know anyone else who is. I, I saw some, I think something like 97 or 98 percent of economists surveyed, plus other indicators like the Fed funds market all, all agree. So, so the Fed's not going to raise interest rates in March. But the problem is, you know, they go from meeting to meeting, and when they take a certain action, all the, uh, the debate's never over. All it does is move to the next meeting, and what are they going to do then? Um, now, just to give a little background, of course, after seven years of zero interest rates, uh, the Fed did achieve what they call liftoff last December. They did raise interest rates 25 basis points. This is the uh, target Fed funds rate. But they laid down a path. They said, look, we want to raise interest rates 300 basis points or 3% over three years. We want to do it slowly, not to shock the markets or not to be too tight, too fast. And that was, you know, logically 100 basis points or 1% a year for three years to get their total 3%. And the minimum increment, to all intents and purposes, is 25 basis points or one quarter, 1%. Uh, not that they couldn't do less, but that would be, uh, there would be not much point in that. So, so assume uh, 25 basis points. So if you say, okay, I'm going to do 100 basis points a year in 25 basis point increments, and I have eight meetings a year, which they do, that suggests that every other meeting they would do 25 basis points, and that would get you to this uh, target they achieved. So the last meeting when they raised rates was December, so I uh, skipped uh, January, and the, so they were on track to raise rates in March. Now, it's always data dependent. They always put in the disclaimers and the caveats, you know, it's, this is data dependent, we're going to see how the markets do, it, et cetera. Well, based on its own criteria, this is not to say I agree because I said that they blundered by raising rates in December. They should not have raised rates in December. They raised into weakness. Uh, the Fed's job is to, uh, you know, ease into weakness and, and tighten into strength to try to modulate the extremes of the economy. So the Fed had no business tightening in December, as far as I was concerned. But my opinion, my vote doesn't count. It's it's the Fed that counts, and I try to when I do this analysis, try to think about it from their point of view. So what they were saying is, you know, labor markets are, are tight, job creation is strong, uh, some early signs of inflation recognize that, you know, monetary policy acts with a lag and they want to stay ahead of the inflation and GDP was on track to get to their targets. Well, that was barely the case in December, but you could argue it, but a lot of those things have actually gotten stronger since then. In other words, fourth quarter growth was fairly positive, uh, fourth quarter of 2015, but first quarter of 2016, at least according to the best data, looks like it's coming in, you know, over 2%, maybe 2.2%. Inflation, at least as measured by uh, PCI core year over year, ticked up a little bit, got closer to the Fed's goal. Job creation has continued to be strong. The February jobs report was very strong. So using the criteria that the Fed says they use, which are growth, jobs, and inflation, they should raise rates tomorrow. They should raise rates at this meeting, but they're clearly not going to. So then the question is, well, what happened? Why did they back off? Well, we know the answer, which is the market volatility, the market drawdown, correction, and then borderline bear market, steep scary drops in January and early February in the markets around the world, U.S. stock market in particular, spooked the Fed. And they felt that you know, to raise rates in that environment could cause a further market meltdown. There's a lot of systemic instability. They don't want to be the cause of another extra panic, so they backed away. That's an interesting thing. So in December, you go to great lengths to lay out a path. The signposts along the path say that you should be raising rates in March, at least as the Fed sees it and yet you get spooked by the markets. So this is like a game of chicken where the Fed um, is behind the wheel of the car that swerves out of the way at the last minute, or you, know, the, you say the Fed blinked in a staring contest. Describe it any way you like. The problem now is how does the Fed get back on track? And just to put that 300 basis point three-year program in, in perspective, Number one, the Fed doesn't see a recession. I do. I think the U.S. economy is heading for a recession. The Fed does not, but that's not unusual. The Fed 
never sees a recession. The Fed uh, staff and using Fed models have never uh, forecast a recession, so they just never see it coming. But there's some other research that actually Larry Summers uh, did point to recently. He said that when a recession does hit, that it takes 300 basis points of cuts on average to get the economy out of the recession. That's how much interest rate policy has to do to get the economy out of a recession. So if a recession's coming, even though the Fed doesn't see it, they've got to raise interest rates 300 basis points in order to cut them 300 basis points in order to get out of a recession, which is probably on the way. They're not going to get there. We're going to have a recession long before they get to 300 basis points. They'll be lucky to get to you know, 75 or 100 basis points, maybe a little higher, before the U.S. economy goes into a recession. So they're in this absolutely impossible situation. They need to raise rates so they can cut them when the recession comes. But the act of raising rates makes the recession itself more likely, and we'll probably have a recession before they ever raise rates enough to cut them enough to get out of the recession. Now, that's a mouthful, but that's where we are. So the Fed is really, they waited too long to raise rates. They should have started years ago. And that's pretty obvious at this point. Not only did they wait too long, they waited so long that they raised them uh, not only too late, but, but probably at the exact wrong time in terms of business cycles. I do think they're going to try to play catch up. The other problem they, they face is the difference between their own intentions and market expectations. And that was the key to concluding that they're not going to raise rates this time, which, I, again, at this point is fairly obvious. But I go back to December, which is not that long ago, markets expected the path I just laid out, namely that there would be a rate hike in March. Well, after the turmoil of January and February, markets changed their expectations and priced in zero, almost zero probability of a rate hike in March. If the Fed wanted to hike rates in March and the market wasn't expecting it and they actually went ahead and did so, that would be a shock. That would be the kind of thing when, when the markets don't expect it and you do it anyway, that's the kind of shock that can uh, sink the stock market. So it's the Fed's job to steer the expectations to where they want them to be so they can pursue policy without causing a shock. Well, they didn't do that. I mean, they did the opposite in speeches from Bill Dudley, uh, I think in early February, uh, Leo Brainerd uh, more recently, a week ago or, or so, were very dovish. And the only sort of quasi hawk was Stanley Fish, but even he wasn't that hawkish. So the Fed did nothing to signal the market that they were going to raise rates, and then it's quite certain now that they won't. If they want to raise rates in June, which I do expect, and which will kind of get them back on the track that I described, and the markets don't expect it right now. Markets are pricing in about a 50% probability, a little bit less. The Fed's going to have to get those expectations up. The Fed's going to have to tell the markets that they plan to raise rates. I expect they will do so, probably in speeches and leaks to you know key reporters like John Hilsenrath at the Wall Street Journal and some others over the course of April and May. So as the markets reprice for their Fed tightening, and as the dollar strengthens based on that, look for more volatility, uh, look for more drawdowns in the stock market, because as I say, the markets are kind of priced for this Pollyanna world where the Fed never hikes rates again. If the Fed actually does proceed to hike rates, that, that will not only be the actual rate increase, but the change in expectations that would probably cause uh, U.S. stock markets to go down. So more volatility in store, John, just fasten your seatbelt. Well, thanks, Jim. I'd like to turn to a different topic, your latest book, The New Case for Gold. And I'd like to focus briefly on the word new. There are several insights in this book that really are unique to the present day situation. I wonder if you could perhaps share with us one in particular that casts a new light on the role of gold today. I'd be very glad to do so, John. And the book is available for pre-order on Amazon right now. It's easy to find uh, the new case for gold on Amazon. And very happy to say that the physical gold fund has worked with my publisher to come out with their own um, edition of it. So you'll be hearing more about that in, in the weeks ahead. But it is available for, for pre-order now. There are two aspects to the word new in the title, one sort of back looking and one forward looking. The title itself is a play on an earlier book uh, that goes back to the early 1980s. Now, as you know, and I'm sure a lot of listeners know, from 1933 to 1975, it was actually illegal for American citizens to own gold. Uh, it was like you know drugs or any other kind of contraband. It was you could be put in jail for the mere ownership of gold. In 1975, uh, in the President Ford administration, that law was changed, so suddenly it became legal 
for Americans to own gold. And a lot of them did so. They bought the, the America didn't have a gold coin at the time. They have one now. The American Gold Eagle, but people bought Krugerrands and Maple Leafs from Canada and and others. But then in 1980, of course, Ronald Reagan was running for president, and it hadn't been that long since Nixon went off the gold center. That was 1971. So it was only nine years later. Uh, we were in the thick of a presidential campaign as we are today. And there was a lot of pressure among Reagan supporters and conservative Republicans to go back to the gold standard. Reagan did what a lot of politicians do when they're two sides story. He said, let's appoint a commission. So when he was elected president in 1981, or 1980 was the election, he was sworn in 1981, he appointed a blue ribbon uh, gold commission to study a return to the gold standard with a lot of prominent economists and prominent uh, you know, public figures. Well, the commission came back and uh, voted in favor of not going back to the gold standard. But like a lot of uh, commissions of this type where the uh, members are divided, uh, there was a minority who felt strongly that we should go back to the gold standard, and they were permitted to write a minority report. Well, the minority report recommending a gold standard it was a public document because, again, this was a public commission. So it was in the public domain. So an enterprising publisher took the minority report, put it in book form, and called it The Case for Gold. And that's kind of a legendary uh, cult classic, if you will, among gold aficionados and people who, uh, who like financial history. So when my book was in the works, I worked with my publisher on the title, and just to kind of hark back to uh, The Case for Gold, they said, why don't we call this The New Case for Gold? Echoing a little bit that old title, and I think some of the readers familiar with the with the case for gold will appreciate that. But there's more to it than nostalgia. There is substance behind the word new. There are 21st century arguments in favor of having gold that simply were not part of the debate in the 80s and 90s, even in the early 2000s. And there are a number of them in the book, but the one that I think is probably the most important is cyber financial warfare. And this is the ability to wipe out uh, digital wealth. You know, I happen to live not far from um, Greenwich, Connecticut, pretty wealthy town. You know, I've got some friends who are, you know, in the billionaire category and some some hedge fund, uh, pretty well-known names. And, uh, you know, you say to them, well, they say, well, I'm you know, very wealthy. I've got, got that. And I say, really? Yeah, tell me about it. And they say, well, I own stocks. I own bonds. I have this money market funds, whatever. And I say, no, you don't. What do you have are electrons. Your wealth is all in digital form. You get online statements. You know, you might get a paper statement in the mail, but that's nothing more than a representation of uh, wealth, if you call it that, which is stored in digital electronic form on the servers and hard drives of brokerage firms, uh, stock exchanges, uh, DTC, that's the uh, Depository Trust Corporation, which is the main a record keeper for all the book entry securities, but all the wealth, all the market wealth in the world, uh, well, not in the world, but in, in the developed world, and certainly the United States, is in digital form. Our friend Vladimir Putin has a 6,000 member cyber brigade uh, outside of Moscow working day and night to be able to hack, infiltrate, and ultimately destroy Western financial markets. Now, I'm not saying he'll do that tomorrow. He might never do it, but they have that capability. And that digital wealth can be wiped out in a heartbeat. So if you don't have some tangible wealth, your wealth, so-called, is extremely vulnerable to hacking, uh, erasure, uh, destruction, destruction, disruption. They can shut down exchanges, shut down banks, wipe out records, and make them impossible to restore. And when I say things like this, this, this is not you know 22nd century science fantasy, science fiction. This is 21st century reality. These things are happening. There are financial wars being fought now. Uh, if you notice, the stock exchanges have been closed at NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange at various times for unexplained reasons. They always say it's some technical computer glitch or configuration problem. Well, you know, every computer problem is some kind of configuration problem. And the other thing that, that troubles me a lot is not so much intentional warfare, although that is a real threat, but accidental warfare. In other words, if you're going to try to infiltrate a stock exchange, you have to probe it. Uh, you have to sort of launch sleeper viruses, get to get your viruses implanted. Well, what if something goes wrong in that process? You're not intending to shut down the stock exchange that day or wipe out some bank records, but you do it by accident. You know, people who remember the Cold War and nuclear war fighting scenarios recall that the two most famous movies about nuclear war were uh, Fell Safe and Dr. Strangelove. And one was uh, an accident, a computer glitch that gave a 
B-52 bomber, a nuclear attack bomber, of the orders to drop nuclear weapons on Moscow that they couldn't call it back because the pilots have been trained to ignore any callback orders for fear of Russian infiltration. The other one was Dr. Strangelove, which was a rogue general who ordered an attack. So uh, these kinds of accidents are probably more likely. So you have to have some tangible wealth. Now, it doesn't have to be gold. Gold would be my first candidate. Could be silver, could be land, could be fine art, could be a number of things. But if you're 100% digital wealth, you're vulnerable to 100% wipeout. I recommend about 10% of your investable assets in a tangible wealth, hard assets, and I would make gold my number one candidate in that category. So John, there's an example of something that, I mean, gold has been around as a form of money for thousands of years. It's been debated hotly, at least since the 1970s when President Nixon suspended the redemption of dollars for gold. But the the arguments in the uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even early 21st century, and the ones that I referred to earlier in the Gold Commission report, the Minority Report, the original case for gold, never mentioned cyber financial warfare because it didn't exist. You know, the internet barely existed. Uh, certainly not in the way we know it today. But these attack viruses didn't exist, and so th there are new arguments, new reasons to have gold that were not part of the classic debate, and these are the ones I include in the book. So that's where the, uh, the, the new in the title, The New Case for Gold, comes from. Well, briefly before I pass to Alex, there's one other particular observation in your book that struck me as really new, and it was a revealing comment on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. You know, it's probably a big story and maybe too long to tell in detail, but maybe you could give us a glimpse of what was going on there before we hand over to Alex here. Sure, John, and my background, uh, you know, I am an advocate for gold ownership along the lines um, for the reasons I just described. I'm not someone who's been, you know, sitting in, a, in his basement for 30 five years counting gold coins. Uh, my background is in the bond market, uh, derivatives, hedge funds, basically the U.S. government securities market primarily, but also a lot of derivatives from that. And I'm, I'm a lawyer in addition to being an economist, so that's all my training and my background in this area. So I have occasion to speak to Fed officials, not necessarily about gold, but about monetary policy. I've spoken to members of the Board of Governors, uh, Regional Reserve Bank presidents, senior staff from the Monetary Research Division of the Fed, you know, and had a lot of colleagues of mine at Long-Term Capital Management who were they had 16 PhDs who were the, uh, the leaders of modern financial theory. So I have a pretty strong immersion in that world. And I've had occasion to speak to Fed officials about Fed solvency. The issue here is, you know, uh, the way I put it in the book, is the Fed broke? That's actually the first sentence in Chapter 1, is the Fed broke? And the way I get at that is to look at the Fed balance sheet. Now, the Fed balance sheet today looks like a really bad hedge fund. And this is all publicly available. You can go to the Federal Reserve System website and find the balance sheet, find the consolidated balance sheet, and it's broken down by regional reserve banks. If you look at the assets, they're predominantly U.S. Treasury securities of different maturities. If you look at the liabilities, it's money. I mean, that's what the Fed prints. You know, whenever I talk about the Fed being insolvent, people say, oh, well, that, that can't be a problem. They can just print the money. Well, they don't. Have, people don't understand that when the Fed prints money, that's not an asset for them. It's a liability. If you pull a dollar bill out of your wallet and, and, and read it, right across the top, it says Federal Reserve Note, where I went to law school, the note is a liability, and, and indeed it is. What we call money is actually a perpetual non-interest-bearing liability of a sometimes insolvent um, central bank. So that's the liability side of the balance sheet. Their capital right now is down to a sliver. It's about 45 billion dollars and their balance sheet is in excess, their total assets are in excess of four trillion dollars. So the Fed has leveraged uh, about 100 to 1, 100 to 1. Now a normal broker dealer uh, or bank is leveraged you know, between uh, say 8 to 1 and uh, 15 to 1. That's considered pretty high leverage in financial institution world, but the Fed is, is leveraged 100 to 1 which means that on a mark to market basis it only takes a 1% decline in your assets to wipe out your capital, right? If you're leveraged 100 to 1, your capital is 1% is of your assets. Assuming your liabilities are constant, which it would be because it's money, and you take your assets down 1%, your capital has been wiped out. Now, just to be clear, this is on a mark-to-market -market basis, meaning take the assets, price them not where they're held on the balance sheet, but at actual market prices, and, and see what you get. By the way, this is something that hedge funds do every day, mutual funds do it every day, banks do it to some extent every day. So mark-to-market accounting is pretty widespread. Now, to be clear, the Fed does not use mark-to-market accounting. 
So when you can stare at the, the Fed balance sheet all day long or look at it every day, you're always going to see a sovereign institution because they hold their assets at cost, not at market. But my thought experiment and my exercise and research was, okay, well, what if we did market to market? What if we treated the Federal Reserve like any other financial institution that has to market to market? Would they be insolvent? And the answer I came up with is that from time to time, using the bond portfolio only, and I was marking the bond portfolio to market, they would be insolvent. Uh, not today, because, uh, again, you have to say, when did they buy the bonds? What was the original maturity? What was the coupon? What's the market uh, price today? You know, Do you have a 10-year note that you've had on your books for three years that makes it, it has seven years left? So that would be the um, how you would compute the duration of the bonds. So there's a lot of technical bond math in this. But cutting through all that, they have been a solvent from time to time if you just reprice the bond market, or sorry, the bond portfolio. In a nice way, over dinner, I asked one of the Fed governors about this individual, you know, took offense and said, you're, I think you're insolvent on a mark to market basis. And the individual said, no, we're not. And then I pressed a little bit, and uh, the, the person said, well, no one's done that math. And I said, well, I've done it, and I think others have, and that's the conclusion I've reached. And then the person kind of sheepishly said, well, maybe, and then finally said, well, if we are, it doesn't matter. So the person went from no to maybe to yes, it doesn't matter in a matter of a minute over the course of dinner, and then we sort of, our topic changed to skiing and wine, so we, uh, I sort of dropped it because I made my point. But I had occasion to speak to another Fed official. This person was not on the Board of Governors, but was even more connected, more inside Bernanke and Yellen's right hand on a lot of very important policy issues. And this individual is a PhD and a lot more rigorous than the governor I was speaking to. And I pressed him as well because I, you know, I'm like a dog with a bone. I just didn't want to let go of it. And uh, this guy was a lot more adamant. He said, we're not in solvent, period, full stop. Look at the balance sheet. He didn't say you don't know what you're talking about, but he was very clearly pushing back on this point. And I have a lot of respect for this individual, So I and I had done the bond math. I knew that if you reprice the bonds, not always, but at certain times when interest rates uh, had gone up, that these bonds were worth a lot less, that they were insolvent on a market-to-market -market basis applied to the bond portfolio. But this individual was adamant that that was never the case. I went back and I said, well, maybe I'm missing something. And I looked at the balance sheet, and lo and behold, the first thing I saw was the gold account. And the Federal Reserve does have uh, a form of paper gold. Uh, you know, the, the Federal Reserve used to have all the gold, and then the Treasury took it and gave the Federal Reserve a, a gold certificate to replace it. If you think about it, that was probably necessary because the Federal Reserve is private and the Treasury is public. And when a public entity takes uh, property from a private entity without compensation, that's a violation of the Fifth Amendment. You know, the, you're not allowed to take property without compensation. So it looks like the Treasury gave the Fed this gold certificate as a, a compensation, but it, but theoretically it must be worth something, and it must give the Fed at least a moral obligation, if not a legal, uh, or a moral claim, if not a legal claim, on the Treasury's gold. Well, interestingly, that's one they carry out historic costs. Well, the historic cost is $42 an ounce. Uh, of course, we all know gold today is, uh, you have to look at the tickers, it's around 12.30 or so. Uh, it's been, it's volatile, but way, way north of $42 an ounce. Well, if you take the value on the Fed's balance sheet, which isn't very high, and divide it by $42 an ounce, and multiply it by $1,200 an ounce, to see how gold is represented by that certificate, what you discover is that the certificate represents about 8,000 tons of gold. At, at today's market. Now, or sorry, the certificate value divided by the $42 comes out to 8,000 tons of gold. That's almost exactly the amount that the Treasury has. Now, the Treasury had uh, 20,000 tons in 1950. It then lost 11,000 tons to our trading partners in the 50s and 60s during Bretton Woods. By 1970, it was down to about 9,000 tons. That's when Nixon closed the gold window in 1971, but we still had 9,000 tons. Between 71 and 1980, the U.S. dumped 1,000 tons in an effort to suppress the price. This is just a continuation of the London Gold Pool, except now the U.S. had to do it on its own. We twisted the IMF's arm. The IMF dumped 700 tons. So between 1971 and 1980, the IMF and the United States together dumped 1,700 tons of gold on the market to suppress the price of gold. That failed. It always does fail. It can last for a while, but it fails in the end. Price of gold went from $35 to $800 an ounce over that time period. 
But one question that's always bugged me, why did the Treasury stop in 1980? Why did they get to 8,000 tons in 1980 and stop? Why didn't they sell another 1,000 tons, then another 1,000, another 1,000? And that was always a bit of a mystery to me. And then you look around at what the U.S. did. You know, in 1999, we got the British to sell their gold um, in stages between uh, 99 and 2009. Uh, over that 10-year period, there was the Central Bank Gold Agreement. We got France and Italy and others to sell some gold. In 2010, we got the IMF to sell 400 tons of gold. Poor Canadians, they sold the last of their gold just the other day, just a couple tons. Uh, the Swiss sold thousands of tons of gold in uh, the early 2000s. So you look around and, and add it all up, and you're talking about you know upwards of 10,000 tons of gold that was sold by the central banks and multilateral institutions since the 90s to suppress the price. Why did the U.S. not sell any? And so suddenly I connect all these dots and I kind of light bulb and I say, well, if the Treasury dipped below 8,000 tons, they wouldn't have enough gold to back up the Fed, which has 8,000 tons on its books. Furthermore, when you take the 8,000 tons valued at $40 an ounce and revalue it, at $1,200 an ounce, lo and behold, Fed becomes very solvent and is only leveraged about 12 to 1, which looks like a normal bank. In other words, the answer to the mystery is the Fed is not insolvent. The Fed is well capitalized, but not because of the bonds, not because of the money prints, but because of the gold. The gold is the Fed's hidden asset. The gold is what's propping up the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. So you've got every governor, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm pretty sure this hasn't even occurred to a lot of the Fed officials. It's one of those deep, dark secrets of the uh, United States financial system. It's kind of hiding in plain sight. You can look at the balance sheet, do the math I just described. You can look at the Treasury Reserve position and see the 8,000 tons, and that's exactly how much the Fed has on their books. And count that gold then it comes to about $400 billion. And with $400 billion on $4 trillion, now you're leveraged 10 to 1, you look like a normal bank. So the good news is that the Fed is not insolvent. They have a hidden asset that if you march it to market, they would be just fine. But I think the bad news for the Fed, maybe the good news for investors, is that the secret asset is gold. So gold is still propping up the Federal Reserve. And I use this to illustrate the fact that we're still on a gold standard. I don't care what anyone says. It's a shadow gold standard. It's not acknowledged publicly. It's not spoken about. But I do write about it in the book. There's a lot more uh, in the new case for gold along these lines. But the world is on a secret shadow gold standard. When I say that, it's not a deep, dark conspiracy. Like I say, it's there in the numbers. We know what China's buying. You know, why does the IMF have, have 3,000 tons? Why does Germany have 3,000 tons? Why does the United States have 8,000 tons? Why is China on the road to acquiring 8,000 tons to match the United States? Why has Russia doubled their gold reserves in the last six years? Why are all these countries buying gold if it has no role? The answer is it does have a role. So if it's good enough for the Chinese and the Russians and the Fed and the Treasury, it's good enough for me. Well, thanks, Jim. And note to our listeners, I mean, this is an example of the kind of insights you're going to find in this book and really does validate that term new in the title, The New Case for Gold. And now over to you, Alex. What questions do you have today from our listeners? Thanks a lot, John. I appreciate that. And Jim, the entire time you were talking about the gold on the Fed balance sheet, I couldn't help but smiling because I was thinking back to this uh, episode where Ron Paul was questioning Ben Bernanke about the role of gold and Ben basically saying the reason we hold it is just out of tradition. I thought that entire thing was pretty funny. Right. <laughs> I've testified before Congress a few times, and if you have an investment Investigatory subcommittee, and I did that once. You're under oath. You have to, you know, raise your right hand and take an oath. But I, I don't think Ben Bernanke was under oath in that particular exchange. Very good. Okay, so we've got a lot of different questions coming in from different parts of the world. Some of these are obviously non-U.S. A couple of quick items. One is we're getting questions about the special edition of the book. That special edition is being produced by Physical Gold Fund in combination with Penguin. It's going to have a chapter or part of it is going to be written by myself and also there's a special part of it that's written by Jim that's not doesn't exist in any other version of the book. These will be available sometime after the, the standard edition is published. If you want more information about it, what I recommend is go to the physicalgoldfund.com website and there's a place where you can put a email in to subscribe for more information. If you've registered for this webinar, you're already going to be on our mailing list. But uh, if, if there's uh, anybody else that you know of that might be interested in that, they can go there and put their, put their information in. So a question that's coming from Amer A. Jim, 
Uh, he's asking about the book audio version. He's saying, how can I purchase the audio version? I drive a lot and would love to listen to it. Well, thank you for that question. And uh, there will be an audio version. It might not be up on Amazon yet, but it will be on the pub date. And the reason I know that is because I actually recorded the audio version. It, this is my third book. I had um, Currency Wars in 2011 and The Death of Money in 2014. And I'm very happy to say that both books uh, continue to sell very well. They're they're timely. Uh, the currency wars are not over, and uh, threats to the international monetary system are not over. So, uh, so those books are are still selling well. But I did not read the audio versions of those. Uh, long story. My publisher sold them to a, a producer. I understand the people who did read them were were great voice actors, and they have their own fans and their own following. So I think they were they were good audio books. But I didn't read them. But like the caller, Alex, I drive a lot. I listen to audiobooks a lot. And I always like the ones read by the author. I just think it, there's no one but the author who can give it just the right nuance in the right places because he or she is the person who read it. So I was happy to see with the new Gold Book, my publisher said they were going to produce the book themselves and how to not sell the rights to another production company. And I immediately raised my hand. I said, well, I'd, I'd love to read it. And they said, oh, you really don't want to do that, do you? you got to sit in the studio for days. I said, no, I would love to do it. I did. It was an interesting experience, literally two days uh, in the studio with earphones on, reading the book. I had a, a world-class uh, voice director. This guy was great guy. We got along great. But he was sort of the Stanley Kubrick of a uh, uh, voice director. The standard was perfection. This guy was so tough on me. And the number of times we had to do things over. And he was always friendly, never got acrimonious. But he would say, uh, you know, Jim, I'm not hearing the uh, D and connected, you know, connected. Uh, so I just had to, like, enunciate my consonants a little more clearly. Uh, so it, it was kind of, an, like I say, an interesting experience. I, I try to talk in a relaxed way. But this was uh, holding my feet to the fire. But we got through it, and uh, that's being edited as we speak. It'll be an unabridged version, so nothing's being cut out. They're just other than uh, my mistakes, but we did them all over. So there will be an audio book. It will be available on Amazon. It will be read by the author. I don't think they put those out for pre-sale because it's like an instantaneous download, and so there's uh, there's really no point in, in doing that. But but it'll be up on the Amazon as a uh, Say it soon under the new case for gold uh, check back. But yes, there will be an audio book, and I read it myself. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that one as well. Okay, very good. So we have a question here that is coming in from HBK Bangalore, and the question is, what will be the impact of decisions of central bank of Western world, such as Bank of Japan, ECB, Fed, on gold prices in emerging market currencies like India, Russia, countries that are net importers of gold? Well, the sure run impact is that the gold price is going to go up. And the reason I, in those local currencies, I, of course, I expect it to go up significantly in all currencies in the fullness of time. But on any given day, uh, I think of gold as money. I, I do not think of gold as a commodity. I don't even think of it as an investment in the classic sense. I think of it as money. But I say, well, if you want money, you should have some gold because of the vulnerabilities of other forms of wealth that we talked about earlier. But What's happening right now, I said that the Fed is not going to raise interest rates this week, and they're not, but that ease is already priced in. In other words, this was something that was signaled partly through Fed in action as early as late January, certainly increasingly through the month of February. So if, if you originally thought they were going to raise, which everybody did, and then you come to the conclusion that they're not going to raise, which is the conclusion, that actually represents a form of ease in terms of expectations. If you have expectations for hike and they don't hike, that's a form of So and that has accounted for the stock market rally uh, since February 12th. So the rally we saw even through Friday, uh, which is pretty significant from the February 11th lows, was all based on this idea that the Fed was not going to raise rates. The problem is we already got our pop. We, we got our our market benefit out of this. So again, the Fed's not going to raise, but but the benefit on on Wednesday, but the benefit of that is already priced in. So now the market's saying, okay, what's next? And what else have we got for us, Fed? Well, I think what the Fed's going to say is, well, what we've got for you is a, is a rate hike. We're going to hike in June, and that's going to, at the margin, obviously be a form of tightening and make the dollar a little bit stronger. Now, the ECB also tightened. When I say tighten, I should be clear what I mean. It's, it's tightening relative to alternatives and relative to expectations. Now, the, now the, the ECB on March 10th last week actually 
lowered their interest rates. They're already into negative territory. They went further into negative territory. I think they're now about negative 40 basis points. So that's a form of easing. Well, it is, except that Draghi in the same breath came out and said, we think that's as far as we're prepared to go. In other words, he was signaling that they're not going to take interest rates lower. So if markets had priced in lower rates and Draghi saying they're not going to take them lower, that's a form of tightening relative to uh, expectations. And indeed, the euro rallied on that news. On the Bank of Japan, the same thing. There was some expectation they would get out the bazooka, and they didn't. They did nothing. But So now all three major central banks, U.S., Japan, and Europe, at ECB, are in a tightening frame relative to alternative courses relative to expectations. That's going to make all these uh, developed economy currencies a little bit stronger relative to emerging markets currencies. So it looks like a risk off in terms of the emerging markets. And what that means is your price of gold in your currency goes up faster than the price of gold in dollars, euros, or yen. So if I were sitting in uh, Bangladesh or India or Malaysia, those currencies have, by the way, those currencies have strengthened recently based on all the seas coming out of Japan, uh, U.S., and Europe. But it looks like literally as of the last few days and as of tomorrow, that easing is over. It's now into tightening mode. That's into risk-off mode, which is going to weaken the emerging market currencies and make the price of gold go up uh, higher in your currency than it will in dollars. This next question, Jim, is coming in from Dale H., and it's a question that I personally find really interesting. And his question is, why isn't Japan concerned about obtaining gold to the same degree as China? And, and I would add to that, why is, for example, Japan, Canada, and U.K. different than, say, China and Russia accumulating? They're, economically, they're not different, so the question is why have they dumped gold? Now, Japan has uh, about 600 tons. It's a little bit low relative to their GDP. Actually, it is, is significantly low relative to their GDP, but it's not nothing. The UK is, has completely inadequate gold. The guys who are completely unprepared, who have uh, gold relative to GDP that you can't find under a microscope, are Australia, Canada, and a few others. And even those who still retain significant gold, They've sold a lot. Switzerland's a good example. Switzerland still has over a thousand tons, but they've sold over a thousand tons in the last several years. So the question is, if Russia and China are acquiring gold, if the U.S. is sitting tight, keeping the gold it's got, why are some of these countries selling gold? And I think the answer is that a they don't understand what I've been describing on this call and in, in my book, The New Case for Gold, and elsewhere is that uh, we we are still on a shadow gold standard. If, look, if confidence in paper money is maintained forever, then you don't need gold. But the history of uh, fiat money is that confidence is not maintained. There are panics from time to time. The international monetary system has collapsed three times in the past hundred years. It will collapse again when it does, probably sooner than later. You're going to need to take steps to restore confidence. Now, I'm not saying that there will automatically be a gold standard. There could be. But even if gold is used as a reference point, or even if it's just a matter of the major economic powers sitting down around a table and rewriting what they call the rules of the game, in other words, reforming the international monetary system, think of it as a poker game. You know, when you sit down at a poker game and you want a big pile of chips, well, in the scenario I described, your chips are going to be gold. Notice the gold powers are going to decide the future of the system, as happened at Bretton Woods, and the gold weaklings are going to be sitting not at the table but against the wall and not have very much to say. So if you're the UK, Australia, Canada, even Japan to some extent, you're just going to tag along with the US. You're just going to accept whatever deal the US cuts because you don't have enough gold to stand up for yourself. Conversely, countries like Russia and China are going to have a very big voice because they're going to be in a position to say, you know what, if we don't like the deal the U.S. is proposing or that the IMF is proposing, we'll just go our own way, start our own currency, use gold to uh, restore confidence, set the price of gold at you know what would be maybe 500% higher than what it is now. Uh, that's where this uh, $10,000 figure comes from, and start the game over on our own. And if you have enough gold, you can do that. So gold are, are going to be your chips in the poker game. The gold powers are going to dictate the future of the international monetary system, whether it's a gold standard or not remains to be seen. It might be an SDR standard, that's IMF World Money Special Drawing Rights. It might be a hybrid. It might even be a gold-backed SDR, which actually makes a certain amount of sense. 
the one thing I can guarantee is that any reference to gold will be at prices of $10,000 per ounce or higher. And the reason I say that is because any lower price is deflationary. In other words, any, any gold standard, it doesn't matter how you design it, is some relationship between gold and paper money. That's all it is. You say, okay, well, what's the dollar price of gold in the standard? How much paper money do I have? How much gold do I have? Uh, how much trade and commerce do I have? And what does the price have to be to be non-deflationary? Now, the problem is, right now, the market is $1,200 approximately, a little, a little higher than that. But we're not on a gold standard. So gold can be wherever the, you know, the market wants to take it, uh, taking into account you know, manipulation and other factors. But if you were going to have a gold standard and you did not want to cut the money supply by 80%, which is uh, comparable to what happened to the UK in 1925, you'd have to set the price of gold high enough so that the amount of gold you had could support enough money to run the financial system. And this is, you know, this is one of the canards I talk about in the book. And by the way, Alex, I, I not only have all the arguments for gold, but I list the arguments against gold, and I, I, sh I knock them down one by one. It was kind of like taking a bowling ball and sending it right down the middle of the uh, alley and knocking down the ten pins. So I hope the uh, readers enjoy that part of it also. But just to give an example of, of what I'm talking about, when the gold bashers come out, or you know, you're on TV, or you're in a debate, or at a cocktail party, whatever, and you say something about gold, some, somebody will say, well, you know, you can't have a gold standard because there's not enough gold to support world finance. That's nonsense. I mean, there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Now, at $1,200 an ounce, no, that would be extremely deflationary. But at $10,000 an ounce, it works just fine. When I talk about $10,000 gold, it's not a made-up number. It's not a number I pull out of a hat to get some attention. It's actually the result of a calculation using a gold to money ratios uh, without having to destroy the money supply. So there's always enough gold at the right price, and that would be one way to reform the international monetary system. But the, the gold uh, weaklings, as I call them, are, are just not going to have a, a voice in that. Okay, that's a very interesting answer. You know, the thing that you said about any price for gold under $10,000 an ounce is deflationary in any kind of a gold-backed system. I mean, that number... That's a pretty big number, I think a lot of people would say. I, I'm reminded of uh, the other day I was watching a, a wealth manager for J.P. Morgan. Uh, I think it was on CNBC, and he was almost insulted, I guess would be the way I would describe it, um, that gold was even $1,200 an ounce, as if there's this kind of resistance to the idea that gold should not be higher than, than a certain amount. I think a lot of people are going to be shocked if it gets out of that range. I won't be shocked because, as I said, we talked about it a long time. But you know, actually, if you go to my uh, second book, The Death of Money, I think it's chapter nine or chapter eleven. But one of the chapters toward the end of the end of the book where I talk about gold, there's a quote from Paul Walker. Uh, again, I, I'd like to emphasize the fact that when I talk about these scenarios of you know s cyber warfare and stock exchanges being closed and the price of gold going up and deflation and inflation, they've all happened. They have all happened. They're all documented. But the quote I found from Paul Volcker was he said exactly what I just said. He said, you don't have to have a gold standard, but if you do, the price of gold would have to be, I mean, he just kind of rolled his eyes and used some, uh, not to say expletives, but uh, he, he, well, I won't repeat his exact words, but he said it would have to go to the moon. It would have to be sky high for that system to work. And he's right. So I quoted him, but again, I, I did the, the math myself just to put a finer point on it. But by the way, $10,000 is the low end of the range. That assumes that you want to back up M1. That's one measure of money supply with 40% gold. If you wanted to back up M2 with 100% gold, which is another way to do it, that price is $45,000 an ounce. Interesting. Okay, very good. All right, so to get into some other questions we have here, Jim, this one's coming in from Arthur S., and he's, uh, he's talking about the equity markets. His question is, if the S&P falls to, say, 1300 1400 what do you expect the response is going to be from the Fed, and will it have any kind of an effect long term? Well, at that level, assuming it's precipitous, which I assume is what the question implies, they would... First of all, obviously not raise rates. Um, if one of the questions I ask myself in thinking about the Fed's rate hiking paths is what would it take for the Fed not to raise rates? And that's one of the scenarios. I don't think we even have to go that low. I think S&P at 1650, you know, if it dropped from, uh, I'm not sure where it is right this minute, but since around 1900 uh, or so, down to 1650 in a matter of, you know, a few weeks, that would be enough to put the Fed on hold. 
Beyond that, what would the Fed do if it continues to fall or if we were clearly in a recession? When I say clearly, I think we're going into a recession based on the data I see, but if it were so clear that even the Fed saw it, they would, uh, the first thing is not hike rates, the second thing would be to cut rates. One thing about, you know, I said that they wanted to get them up to 300 basis points, cut them 300 basis points, but they may get to 75 or 100 basis points and when the recession hits, in which case they would cut 75 or 100 basis points, get back down to zero. And, you know, we've heard this a lot, and I know our cash in, uh, New York Stock Exchange, a lot of people see him on television, he said they will get to zero before they get to 1%, meaning they would have to turn around and cut and go back down to zero before they ever got far enough along. I think that's probably right. At least it's a pretty good estimate. And then beyond that, uh, so first you stop hiking, then you cut, what else could they do? Well, they could use forward guidance, which would basically say, well, not only do, not only are we raising, not only are we at zero, but we're going to stay there for a you know considerable period. Pick your adjectives, you know, pick your phrase. And we're going to be patient. Remember all these famous buzzwords from the just take the period of forward guidance from about uh, 2010 to 2015 mm -hmm. uh, when they finally ended it. They had uh, you know extended period, considerable period, patient, you name it. Uh, they could get the thesaurus out and come up with some new phrases, but that would be next. You know, it's the toolkit. You know, currency wars, QE4 negative interest rates. There are a lot of things they could do, but they'll certainly be easing heavily if the stock market falls that much. So we are getting close to the end of our time, and we have a ton of questions left, so we're going to try and lightning round a couple of these. This one particular question is coming in from multiple people. Vince W. is one of them. Michael K. is one of them. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it because they answered it, uh, asked it in, different, uh, in a slightly different way, but the question essentially is, what do you think the likelihood is of some kind of massive windfall profit tax on gold, and is this a likely event? What can anybody do to mitigate such a risk? Should you still buy gold? Uh, these are all the kinds of the questions that are coming in regards to that. Well, I'm certainly not going to give um, give tax advice, but I would say the thing about a windfall profits tax is that uh, it would have to be an act of Congress. Uh, I don't think uh, the, and the president's not shy about using executive orders and emergency powers. You know, when gold was confiscated by FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1933, that was an executive order. That was not an act of Congress. Later on, Congress did pass a law that ratified what the president did after the fact, but the day he did it, it was an executive order. And you say, gee, what was President Roosevelt's statutory authority for giving an executive order confiscating all the gold in America and making it a felony to own gold? Well, it was the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, which is interesting because the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 was enacted during World War I so the United States could seize German assets in the United States, which we did. That's how we got Bayer Aspen. Uh, Bayer AG, um, Action Gesellschaft, was actually a major German chemical and pharmaceutical company, and we seized their U.S. affiliate in World War One. And that's what we call Bayer Aspen today under the Trading with the Enemy Act. I'm not sure who the enemy was in 1933. It must have been the American people. But that was, you know, the FDR never let a, a statue stand in the way of a good executive order. However, taxation is a step too far. The Constitution is crystal clear that tax bills have to originate not only in the Congress, but in the House of Representatives specifically. So what I would say to investors is I find it unlike, I mean, I've written about it. I think as an analyst, it's my job to point out all the risks, and that's not one you could rule out, uh, and I don't rule it out, but I think that it, it's unlikely because it would have to be approved by Congress, and even if it somehow got through the Congress, um, you'd see it coming. The unlikely prospect of a windfall profit tax, which you could probably see coming, is not a reason not to own gold. Uh, I find that, uh, you know, it's amazing, Alex, I'll talk to people about, I remember talking to people about gold when it was $700, and not that long ago, by the way. I'd say, you know, you really want to have a little gold in your portfolio, 10% or whatever, and the person would listen to you and say, you know what, you're right, I, I should do that. Then you'd see them six months later and say, you know, did you get the gold? And they'd go, oh, no. You know, and then six months after that, did you get the gold? No. Even people who are intrigued by it, people who are uh, persuaded by the argument, people who see the benefit of having gold in your portfolio, don't actually go out and get any. And just to take it a step further, what they do is they, they look for excuses not to get it. People are lazy, basically. They hate to do anything. Uh, there's a lot of the behavioral science to back that up. So what you happen is you, 
you, you, you run into these people, and they, I'm not saying the question is one of them, by the way, but I'm just using this as a kind of a platform to make the point. You run into people say, well, yeah, gold will go up a lot, but the government's just going to have a windfall profits tax. I'm not going to get the profits, so I'm not going to buy any gold. That is not a reason not to buy gold. Like, like I say, the, the profits tax is unlikely. Even if it did happen, you could see it coming. So in theory, there'd be plenty of time to, you know, swap out of gold and uh, get into land or fine art or some other other hard asset. But I think the more likely outcome is that uh, even if somebody thought that was a good idea, it wouldn't go anywhere. But it is certainly not a reason not to own gold. Very good. That's a great answer. Okay, so I think we have time for just one quick more question. And for those of you who have been on this webinar and are asking questions, if you like this format where we're allowing more time for people to ask questions, we've been considering doing a full hour of just Q&A or something along those lines. So if you would be interested in something like that, please give us feedback, email us, or maybe message us on Twitter or something like that so we know what everybody would like to do in regards to that. So the last question of the day, Jim, is going to be, this is coming from Michael um, he wrote quite a bit here, but I'm just going to kind of uh, summarize it down into, into a short question, and it, it comes down to how possible is a scenario where there is no major crash and we all may avoid pain and misery? Well, first of all, it is possible, and I've never ruled it out. But then the question you have to ask yourself is, okay, you know, it's not going to be uh, mystical. You know, what, what set of public policies would it take to help the economy grow, uh, get it out from under our debt burden, not through inflation or default, but through legitimate growth, with price stability, where the dollar value of gold would not change very much because we had uh, a monetary anchor and a stable, stable international financial system and price stability. So that's the happy outcome. What would it take? Well, the problem with the economy, and it has been, it's just been true since 2008, probably longer, maybe going all the way back to to uh, 2001 is structural. We have structural problems. And everything the Fed has done is monetary. You cannot solve a structural problem with monetary solutions. That's why we still have lousy growth. That's why we have 50 million Americans on food stamps. That's why, despite job creation, we can't get wages up. We can't get aggregate demand up, etc. So what are structural solutions and what would they be? Well, I would say how about zero capital gains tax? How about a reduction in the income tax? Less, um, less regulation, more liberal, uh, you know, labor laws. In Europe, you would look for labor mobility. In Japan, you would look for more inclusion of women, more liberal immigration. Let the Filipinos to now go to the Middle East, go to Japan, and take up a lot of jobs and help that economy overcome a demographic hurdle. So there are a long list of very positive things you could do to generate real growth. Then the next question is, okay, what's the likelihood of any of them? The answer is pretty close to zero. I don't see the political will, the political leadership, or the consensus to do any of these things. What I see is delay, denial, over-reliance on central bank uh, voodoo, and an unwillingness to confront the problem, which leads me to conclude that the system will collapse. Okay. And with that uh, rosy remark ending, I guess we're, uh, we're done, Jim. I really appreciate of course, after seven years of zero interest rates, uh, the Fed did achieve what they call liftoff last December. They did raise interest rates 25 basis points. This is the uh, target Fed funds rate. But they laid out a path. They said, look, we want to raise interest rates 300 basis points or 3% over three years. We want to do it slowly, not to shock the markets or not to be too tight, too fast. And that was, you know, logically 100 basis points points or 1% a year for three years to get their total 3%. And the minimum increment to all intents and purposes is 25 basis points or one quarter 1%. Uh, not that they couldn't do less, but that would be, uh, there would be not much point in that. So, so assume uh, 25 basis points. So if you say, okay, I'm going to do 100 basis points a year in 25 basis point increments, and I have eight meetings a year, which they do, that suggests that every other meeting they would do 25 basis points, and that would get you to this uh, target they achieved. So the last meeting when they raised rates was December, so I uh, skipped uh, January, and the, so they were on track to raise rates in March. Now, it's always data dependent. They always put in the disclaimers and the caveats, you know, it's, this is data dependent, we're going to see how the markets do, it, et cetera. Well, based on its own criteria, this is not to say I agree because I said that they blundered by raising rates in December. They should not have raised rates in December. They raised into weakness. Uh, the Fed's job is to uh, you know, ease into weakness and, and tighten into strength to 
try to modulate the extremes of the economy. So the Fed had no business tightening in December, as far as I was concerned. But my opinion, my vote doesn't count. It's it's the Fed that counts, and I try to, when I do this analysis, try to think about it from their point of view. So what they were saying is, you know, labor markets are, are tight, job creation is strong, uh, some early signs of inflation recognized that, you know, monetary policy acts with a lag, and they want to stay ahead of the inflation, and GDP was on track to get to their targets. Well. That was barely the case in December, but you could argue it. But a lot of those things have actually gotten stronger since then. In other words, fourth quarter growth was fairly positive, uh, fourth quarter of 2015, but first quarter of 2016, at least according to the best data, looks like it's coming in you know, over 2%, maybe 2.2%. Inflation, at least as measured by uh, PCI core, that look for more volatility, uh, look for more drawdowns in the stock market. Because as I say, the markets are kind of priced for this Pollyanna world where the Fed never hikes rates again. If the Fed actually does proceed to hike rates, that, that will not only be the actual rate increase, but the change in expectations that would probably cause uh, U.S. stock markets to go down. So more volatility in store, John. Just fasten your seatbelt. Well, thanks, Jim. I'd like to turn to a different topic. Your latest book, The New Case for Gold. And I'd like to focus briefly on the word new. There are several insights in this book that really are unique to the present day situation. I wonder if you could perhaps share with us one in particular that casts a new light on the role of gold today. I'd be very glad to do so, John. And the book is available for pre-order on Amazon right now. It's easy to find uh, the new case for gold on Amazon. And very happy to say that the physical gold fund has worked with my publisher to come out with their own um, edition of it. So you'll be hearing more about that. And, in the weeks ahead, but it is available for, for pre-order now. There are two aspects to the word new in the title, one sort of backward-looking and one forward-looking. The title itself is a play on an earlier book uh, that goes back to the early 1980s. Now, as you know, and I'm sure a lot of listeners know, from 1933 to 1975, it was actually illegal for American citizens to own gold. Uh, it was like you know drugs or any other kind of contraband. It was you could be put in jail for the mere ownership of gold. In 1975, and in the President Ford administration, that law was changed, so suddenly it became legal for Americans to own gold, and a lot of them did so. They bought, uh, America didn't have a gold coin at the time. They have one now, the American Gold Eagle, but people bought Kruger Rands and Maple Leafs from Canada and, and others. But then in 1980, of course, Ronald Reagan was running for president, and it hadn't been that long since Nixon went off the gold standard. That was 1971. So it was only nine years later. Uh, we were in the thick of a presidential campaign as we are today. And there was a lot of pressure among Reagan supporters and conservative Republicans to go back to the gold standard. Reagan did what a lot of politicians do when they're two sides of the story. He said, let's appoint a commission. So when he was elected president in 1981, or 1980 was the election. Was Hello, I'm John Ward on behalf of Physical Gold Fund. We're delighted to welcome you to the latest webinar with Jim Rickards in the series we're calling The Gold Chronicles. Jim Rickards is a New York Times best-selling author and the chief global strategist for West Shore Funds. He's the former general counsel of long-term capital management. He's a consultant to the U.S. intelligence community and to the Department of Defense. He's also an advisory board member of Physical Gold Fund. Hello, Jim, and welcome. Hi, John. How are you? Just great, thanks. Good to have you on board here. So we also have with us Alex Danzig, the Managing Director of Physical Gold Fund. Hello, Alex. Hi, John. Great to be here for another Physical Gold Fund's Gold Chronicles podcast. So Alex will be looking out for questions that come from you, our listeners. So let me just say that your questions for Jim Rickers today are more than welcome. You can post them at any point during the interview. You'll see a box on your screen for typing in your question. And as time allows, we'll do our best to respond to you. By the way, we're making an effort today to create a little bit more time than last Last time for your questions, so look forward to that. Jim, today, as I said, I'd like to keep our conversation a bit shorter so we have more time for questions from our listeners. But first, let's briefly check in on the current monetary situation. The March Federal Open Market Committee meeting is taking place today and tomorrow, and I'm just wondering if you expect any surprises from the FOMC this month. Well, there is one thing in play. Clearly, they are not going to raise interest rates. If they did, I would be shocked, but so would everybody else. As you know, John, I'm not uh, shy or averse to being out of consensus. I've made a number of 
out of consensus forecasts. I'm never troubled by that. If my analysis points me in a certain direction, that's where I go. But I don't do it just to be contrary. I do it because that's where the analysis takes me. But there are times when I think the consensus has got it right, and this is one of them. So I'm not expecting a rate increase by the Fed, and I don't know anyone else who is. I, I saw some, I think something like 97 or 98 percent of economists surveyed, plus other indicators like the Fed funds market all, all agree. So, so the Fed's not going to raise interest rates in March. But the problem is, you know, they go from meeting to meeting, and when they take a certain action, all the, the debate's never over. All it does is move to the next meeting and what are they going to do then? Um, now, just to give a little background, they need to raise rates so they can cut them when the recession comes, but the act of raising rates makes the recession itself more likely and we'll probably have a recession before they ever raise rates enough to cut them enough to get out of the recession. Now, that's a mouthful, but that's where we are. So the Fed is really, they waited too long to raise rates. They should have started years ago. And that's pretty obvious at this point. Not only did they wait too long, they waited so long that they raised them uh, not only too late, but but probably at the exact wrong time in terms of business cycles. I do think they're going to try to play catch up. The other problem they, they face is the difference between their own intentions and market expectations. And that was the key to concluding that they're not going to raise rates this time, which, again, at this point is fairly obvious. But I go back to December, which is not that long ago, markets expected the path I just laid out, namely that there would be a rate hike in March. Well, after the turmoil of January and February, markets changed their expectations and priced in zero, almost zero probability of a rate hike in March. If the Fed wanted to hike rates in March and the market wasn't expecting it and they actually went ahead and did so, that would be a shock. That would be the kind of thing when, when the markets don't expect it and you do it anyway, that's the kind of shock that can uh, sink the stock market. So it's the Fed's job to steer the expectations to where they want them to be so they can pursue policy without causing a shock. Well, they didn't do that. I mean, they did the opposite. In speeches from Bill Dudley, I think in early February, uh, Leo Brannard, uh, more recently, a week ago or, or so, were very dovish. And the only sort of quasi-hawk was Stanley Fish, but even he wasn't that hawkish. So the Fed did nothing to signal the market that they were going to raise rates, and then it's quite certain now that they won't. If they want to raise rates in June, which I do expect, and which will kind of get them back on the track that I described, and the markets don't expect it right now, markets are pricing in about a 50% probability, a little bit less, the Fed's going to have to get those expectations up. The Fed's going to have to tell the markets that they plan to raise rates. I expect they will do so, probably in speeches and leaks to you know key reporters like John Hilsenrath at the Wall Street Journal and some others over the course of April and May. So... As the markets reprice for further Fed tightening and as the dollar strengthens based on the year over year, ticked up a little bit, got closer to the Fed's goal, job creation has continued to be strong, the February jobs report was very strong. So using the criteria that the Fed says they use, which are growth, jobs, and inflation, they should raise rates tomorrow. They should raise rates at this meeting. But they're clearly not going to. So then the question is, well, what happened? Why did they back off? Well, we know the answer, which is the market volatility, the market drawdown, correction, and then borderline bear market, steep, scary drops in January and early February in the markets around the world, so U.S. stock market in particular, spooked the Fed. And they felt that you know, to raise rates in that environment could cause a further market meltdown. There's a lot of systemic instability. They don't want to be the cause of another extra panic, so they backed away. That's an interesting thing. So in December, you go to great lengths to lay out a path. The assigned posts along the path say that you should be raising rates in March, at least as the Fed sees it and yet you get spooked by the markets. This is like a game of chicken where the Fed um, is behind the wheel of the car that swerves out of the way at the last minute, or you, know, you can say the Fed blinked in a staring contest. Describe it any way you like. The problem now is how does the Fed get back on track? And just to put that 300 basis point three-year program in, in perspective, number one, the Fed doesn't see a recession. I do. I think the U.S. economy is setting for a recession. The Fed does not, but that's not unusual. The Fed never sees a recession. The Fed uh, staff and using Fed models have never uh, forecast a recession, so they just never see it coming. But there's some other research that actually Larry Summers uh, did point to recently. He said that when a recession does hit, that it takes 300 basis points of cuts 
on average, to get the economy out of the recession. That's how much interest rate policy has to do to get the economy out of a recession. So if a recession is coming, even though the Fed doesn't see it, they've got to raise interest rates 300 basis points. In a week ago or, or so, we're very dovish. And the only sort of quasi-hawk was Stanley Fish, but even he wasn't that hawkish. So the Fed did nothing to signal the market that they were going to raise rates, and then it's quite certain now that they won't. If they want to raise rates in June, which I do expect, and which will kind of get them back on the track that I described, and the markets don't expect it right now, markets are pricing in about a 50% probability, a little bit less, the Fed's going to have to get those expectations up. The Fed's going to have to tell the markets that they plan to raise rates. I expect they will do so, probably in speeches and leaks to you know key reporters like John Hilsenrath at the Wall Street Journal and some others over the course of April and May. So. As the markets reprice for further Fed tightening and as the dollar strengthens based on that, look for more volatility, I'll look for more drawdowns in the stock market because as I say, the markets are kind of priced for this Pollyanna world where the Fed never hikes rates again. If the Fed actually does proceed to hike rates, that, that will not only be the actual rate increase but the change in expectations that would probably cause uh, U.S. stock markets to go down. So more volatility in store, John, just fasten your seatbelt. Well, thanks, Jim. I'd like to turn to a different topic, your latest book, The New Case for Gold. And I'd like to focus briefly on the word new. There are several insights in this book that really are unique to the present day situation. I wonder if you could perhaps share with us one in particular that casts a new light on the role of gold today. I'd be very glad to do so, John. And the book is available for pre-order on Amazon right now. It's easy to find uh, the new case for gold on Amazon. And very happy to say that the physical gold fund has worked with my publisher to come out with their own um, edition of it. So you'll be hearing more about that in, in the weeks ahead. But it is available for, for pre-order now. There are two aspects to the word new in the title, one sort of back looking and one forward looking. The title itself is a play on an earlier book uh, that goes back to the early 1980s. Now, as you know, and I'm sure a lot of listeners know, from 1933 to 1975, it was actually illegal for American citizens to own gold. Uh, it was like you know drugs or any other kind of contraband. It was you could be put in jail for the mere ownership of gold. In 1975, and in the President Ford administration, that law was changed, so suddenly it became legal for Americans to own gold, and a lot of them did so. They bought, the, the America didn't have a gold coin at the time. They have one now, the American Gold Eagle, but people bought Kruger Rands and Maple Leafs from Canada and, and others. But then in 1980, of course, Ronald Reagan was running for president, and it hadn't been that long since Nixon went off the gold standard. That was 1971. So it was only nine years later. Uh, we were in the thick of a presidential campaign as we are today. And there was a lot of pressure among Reagan supporters and conservative Republicans to go back to the gold standard. Reagan did what a lot of politicians do when they're two sides story. He said, let's appoint a commission. So when he was elected president in 1981, or 1980 was the election, he was sworn in 1981, he appointed a blue ribbon uh, gold commission to study a return to the gold standard with a lot of prominent economists and prominent uh, you know, public figures. Well, the commission came back and uh, voted in favor of not going back to the gold standard. But like a lot of uh, commissions of this type where the uh, members are divided, uh, there was a minority who felt strongly that we should go back to the gold standard, and they were permitted to write a minority report. Well, the minority report recommending a gold standard was a public orders to drop nuclear weapons on Moscow that they couldn't call it back because the pilots have been trained to ignore any callback orders for fear of Russian infiltration. The other one was Dr. Strangelove, which was a rogue general who ordered an attack. So uh, these kinds of accidents are probably more likely. So you have to have some tangible wealth. Now, it doesn't have to be gold. Gold would be my first candidate. Could be silver, could be land, could be fine art, could be a number of things. But if you're 100% digital wealth, you're vulnerable to 100% wipeout. I recommend about 10% of your investable assets in a tangible wealth, hard assets, and I would make gold my number one candidate in that category. So John, there's an example of something that, I mean, gold has been around as a form of money for thousands of years. It's been debated hotly, at least since the 1970s when President Nixon suspended the redemption of dollars for gold. 
But the the arguments in the uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even early 21st century, and the ones that I referred to earlier in the Gold Commission report, the Minority Report, the original case for gold, never mentioned cyber financial warfare because it didn't exist. You know, the internet barely existed. Uh, certainly not in the way we know it today, but these attack viruses didn't exist. And so th there are new arguments, new reasons to have gold that were not part of the classic debate, and these are the ones I include in the book. So that's where the, uh, the, the new in the title, The New Case for Gold, comes from. Well, briefly before I pass to Alex, there's one other particular observation in your book that struck me as really new, and it was a revealing comment on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. You know, it's probably a big story and maybe too long to tell in detail, but maybe you could give us a glimpse of what was going on there before we hand over to Alex here. Sure, John, and my background, uh, you know, I am an advocate for gold ownership along the lines um, for the reasons I just described. I'm not someone who's been, you know, sitting in, a, in his basement for 30 five years counting gold coins. Uh, my background is in the bond market, uh, derivatives, hedge funds, basically the U.S. government securities market primarily, but also a lot of derivatives from that. And I'm, I'm a lawyer in addition to being an economist, so that's all my training and my background in this area. So I have occasion to speak to Fed officials, not necessarily about gold, but about monetary policy. I've spoken to members of the Board of Governors, uh, Regional Reserve Bank presidents, senior staff from the Monetary Research Division of the Fed, you know, and had a lot of colleagues of mine at Long-Term Capital Management who were they had 16 PhDs who were the, uh, the leaders of modern financial theory. So I have a pretty strong immersion in that world. And I've had occasion to speak to Fed officials about Fed solvency. The issue here is, you know, uh, the way I put it in the book, is the Fed broke? That's actually the first sentence in Chapter 1, is the Fed broke? And the way I get at that is to look at the Fed balance sheet. Now, the Fed balance sheet today looks like a really bad hedge fund. And this is all publicly available. You can go to the Federal Reserve System website and find the balance sheet, find the consolidated balance sheet, and it's broken down by regional reserve banks. If you look at the assets, they're predominantly U.S. Treasury securities of different maturities. If you look at the liabilities, it's money. I mean, that's what the Fed prints. You know, whenever I talk about the Fed being insolvent, people say, oh, well, that, that can't be a problem. They can just print the money. Well, they don't. Have, people don't understand that when the Fed prints money, that's not an asset for them. It's a liability. If you pull a dollar bill out of your wallet and, and, and read it, right across the top, it says Federal Reserve Note. Where I went to law school, the note is a liability, and, and indeed it is. What we call money is actually a perpetual non-interest-bearing liability of a sometimes insolvent um, central bank. So that's the liability side of the balance sheet. Their capital right now is down to document because, again, this was a public commission. So it was in the public domain. So an enterprising publisher took the minority report, put it in book form, and called it the case for gold. And that's kind of a legendary uh, cult classic, if you will, among gold aficionados and people who, uh, who like financial history. So when my book was in the works, I worked with my publisher on the title and just to kind of hark back to uh, the case for gold, they said, why don't we call this the new case for gold? Echoing a little bit that little title, and I think some of the readers familiar with the, with the case for gold will appreciate that. But there's more to it than nostalgia. There is substance behind the word new. There are 21st century arguments in favor of having gold that simply were not part of the debate in the 80s and 90s, even in the early 2000s. And there are a number of them in the book, but the one that I think is probably the most important is cyber financial warfare. And this is the ability to wipe out uh, digital wealth. You know, I happen to live not far from um, Greenwich, Connecticut, pretty wealthy town. You know, I've got some friends who are, you know, in the billionaire category and some, some hedge fund, uh, pretty well-known names. And, uh, you know, you say to them, well, let's see, well, I'm you know, very wealthy guy. About that, and I say, really? Yeah, tell me about it. And they say, well, I own stocks, I own bonds, I have this money market funds, whatever. And I say, no, you don't. What you have are electrons. Your wealth is all in digital form. You get online statements. You know, you might get a paper statement in the mail, but that's nothing more than a representation of uh, wealth, if you call it that, which is stored in digital electronic form on the servers and hard drives of brokerage firms, uh, stock exchanges. Uh, DTC, that's the uh, Depository Trust Corporation, which is the main uh, record keeper for all the book entry securities. But all the wealth, all the market wealth in the world, uh, well, not in the world, but in, in the developed world, and certainly the United States, is in digital form. Our friend Vladimir Putin has a 6,000-member cyber brigade uh, outside of Moscow working day and night to be able to hack, infiltrate, and ultimately destroy 
Western financial markets. Now, I'm not saying he'll do that tomorrow. He might never do it, but they have that capability, and that digital wealth can be wiped out in a heartbeat. So if you don't have some tangible wealth, your wealth, so-called, is extremely vulnerable to hacking, uh, erasure, uh, destruction, destruction, disruption. They can shut down exchanges, shut down banks, wipe out records, and make them impossible to restore. And when I say things like this, this, this is not you know 22nd century science fantasy, science fiction. This is 21st century reality. These things are happening. There are financial wars being fought now. Uh, if you notice, the stock exchanges have been closed. The Nasdaq and New York Stock Exchange at various times for unexplained reasons. They always say it's some technical computer glitch or configuration problem. Well, you know, every computer problem is some kind of configuration problem. And the other thing that, that troubles me a lot is not so much intentional warfare, although that is a real threat, but accidental warfare. In other words, if you're going to try to infiltrate a stock exchange, you have to probe it. Uh, you have to sort of launch sleeper viruses, get, to get your viruses implanted. Well, what if something goes wrong in that process? You're not intending to shut down the stock exchange that day or wipe out some bank records, but you do it by accident. You know, people who remember the Cold War and nuclear war fighting scenarios recall that the two most famous movies about nuclear war were uh, Fell Safe and Dr. Strangelove. And one was uh, an accident, a computer glitch that gave a B-52 bomber, a nuclear attack bomber. They should raise rates tomorrow. They should raise rates at this meeting, but they're clearly not going to. So then the question is, well, what happened? Why did they back off? Well, we know the answer, which is the market volatility, the market drawdown, correction, and then borderline bear market, steep, scary drops in January and early February in the markets around the world, U.S. stock market in particular, spooked the Fed. And they felt that you know, to raise rates in that environment could cause further market meltdown. There's a lot of systemic instability. They don't want to be the cause of another financial panic, so they backed away. That's an interesting thing. So in December, you go to great lengths to lay out a path. The assigned posts along the path say that you should be raising rates in March, at least as the Fed sees it and yet you get spooked by the markets. This is like a game of chicken where the Fed um, is behind the wheel of the car that swerves out of the way at the last minute, or you, know, you can say the Fed blinked in a staring contest. Describe it any way you like. The problem now is how does the Fed get back on track? And just to put that 300 basis point three-year program in, in perspective, number one, the Fed doesn't see a recession. I do. I think the U.S. economy is heading for a recession. The Fed does not, but that's not unusual. The Fed never sees a recession. The Fed uh, staff and uh, using Fed models have never uh, forecast a recession, so they just never see it coming. But there's some other research that actually Larry Summers uh, did point to recently. He said that when a recession does hit, that it takes 300 basis points of cuts on average to get the economy out of the recession. That's how much interest rate policy has to do to get the economy out of a recession. So if a recession's coming, even though the Fed doesn't see it, they've got to raise interest rates 300 basis points in order to cut them 300 basis points in order to get out of a recession, which is probably on the way. They're not going to get there. We're going to have a recession long before they get to 300 basis points. They'll be lucky to get to you know, 75 or 100 basis points, maybe a little higher, before the U.S. economy goes into a recession. So they're in this absolutely impossible situation. They need to raise rates so they can cut them when the recession comes. But the act of raising rates makes the recession itself more likely, and we'll probably have a recession before they ever raise rates enough to cut them enough to get out of the recession. Now, that's a mouthful, but that's where we are. So the Fed is really, they waited too long to raise rates. They should have started years ago. And that's pretty obvious at this point. Not only did they wait too long, they waited so long that they raised them uh, not only too late, but, but probably at the exact wrong time in terms of business cycles. I do think they're going to try to play catch up. The other problem they, they face is the difference between their own intentions and market expectations. And that was the key to concluding that they're not going to raise rates this time, which, again, at this point is fairly obvious. But I go back to December, which is not that long ago, markets expected the path I just laid out, namely that there would be a rate hike in March. Well, after the turmoil of January and February, markets changed their expectations and priced in zero, almost zero probability of a rate hike in March. If the Fed wanted to hike rates in March and the market wasn't expecting it and they actually went ahead and did so, 
that would be a shock. That would be the kind of thing when, when the markets don't expect it and you do it anyway, that's the kind of shock that can uh, sink the stock market. So it's the Fed's job to steer the expectations to where they want them to be so they can pursue policy without causing a shock. Well, they didn't do that. I mean, they did the opposite in speeches from Bill Dudley, I think in early February, uh, Leo Brainerd uh, more recently. Monetary situation. The March Federal Open Market Committee meeting is taking place today and tomorrow. And I'm just wondering if you expect any surprises from the FOMC this month. Well, there is one thing in play. Clearly, they are not going to raise interest rates. If they did, I would be shocked, but so would everybody else. As you know, John, I'm not uh, shy or averse to being out of consensus. I've made a number of out of consensus forecasts. I'm never troubled by that. If my analysis points me in a certain direction, that's where I go. But I don't do it just to be contrary. I do it because that's where the analysis takes me. But there are times when I think the consensus has got it right, and this is one of them. So I'm not expecting a rate increase by the Fed, and I don't know anyone else who is. I, I saw some, I think something like 97 or 98 percent of economists surveyed, plus other indicators like the Fed funds market all, all agree. So, so the Fed's not going to raise interest rates in March. But the problem is, you know, they go from meeting to meeting, and when they take a certain action, all that the debate's never over. All it does is move to the next meeting. And we'll they're going to do then. Um, now, just to give a little background, of course, after seven years of zero interest rates, uh, the Fed did achieve what they call liftoff last December. They did raise interest rates 25 basis points. This is the uh, target Fed funds rate. But they laid out a path. They said, look, we want to raise interest rates 300 basis points or 3% over three years. We want to do it slowly, not to shock the markets or not to be too tight, too fast. And that was, you know, logically 100 basis points or 1% a year for three years to get their total 3%. And the minimum increment to all intents and purposes is 25 basis points or one quarter 1%. Uh, not that they couldn't do less, but that would be, uh, would be not much point in that. So, so assume uh, 25 basis points. So if you say, okay, I'm going to do 100 basis points a year in 25 basis point increments, and I have eight meetings a year, which they do, that suggests that every other meeting they would do 25 basis points, and that would get you to this uh, target they achieved. So the last meeting when they raised rates was December, so I uh, skipped uh, January, and the, so they were on track to raise rates in March. Now, it's always data dependent. They always put in the disclaimers and the caveats, you know, it's, this is data dependent, we're going to see how the markets do, it, et cetera. Well, based on its own criteria, this is not to say I agree because I said that they blundered by raising rates in December. They should not have raised rates in December. They raised into weakness. Uh, the Fed's job is to uh, you know, ease into weakness and, and tighten into strength to try to modulate the extremes of the economy. So the Fed had no business tightening in December as far as I was concerned. But my opinion, my vote doesn't count. It's, it's the Fed that counts, and I try to when I do this analysis, try to think about it from their point of view. So what they were saying is, you know, labor markets are, are tight, job creation is strong, uh, some early signs of inflation recognize that, you know, monetary policy acts with a lag and they want to stay ahead of the inflation and GDP was on track to get to their targets. Well, that was barely the case in December, but you could argue it. But a lot of those things have actually gotten stronger since then. In other words, fourth quarter growth was fairly positive, uh, fourth quarter of 2015, but first quarter of 2016, at least according to the best data, looks like it's coming in you know, over 2%, maybe 2.2%. Inflation, at least as measured by uh, PCI core year over year, ticked up a little bit, got closer to the Fed's goal. Job creation has continued to be strong. The February jobs report was very strong. So using the criteria that the Fed says they use, which are growth, jobs, and inflation,